the Traditional Fest. And so um, our plan for today is to just finish going through 4.9 real fast. I know we'll cover. Um, I'll do just a quick example of this. And the book uses this example for both, so I'll do the same thing. If we need to go more, like the harder ones, so we can cover that as well. But uh, we're going to finish that and then just review. So give your questions and we'll, we'll just have a good time reviewing for the midterm. So, okay, last time we learned about the trapezoid rule, right? Which again, just to, to emphasize, um, both the rules on the board, or that was not finished yet, but, um, are used to approximate integrals because as of right now, there's still a lot that you guys can do in terms of integration. Um, and even like with all knowing all the techniques, there's still some integrals that can't be evaluated. So these um, rules help you give a really good evaluated estimation. Um, when you're not sure of an answer, or at least maybe to get into the ballpark somewhere. So when we were talking about trapezoidal rule, we said, okay, so instead of rectangles, we're going to make trapezoids. And then for each, we had each trapezoid set up and we saw those equations. And when we added them all together, we got this equation, which is basically I take delta x, which as a reminder, delta x has minus a over n, right? So whatever your left end point a is and whatever your right end point b is, I subtract those and divide it by the number of rectangles. Um, that's going to be my delta x. I divide that by two, and then I take f at x zero plus two times f of x one. So again, x i is the same thing as a plus i plus delta x, right? So I start at some a value, and then I add a delta x each time to get each value. Um, unique, maybe from when we were doing the rectangles, is the fact that I do include an f x o now, or an x o. But, but XO is, is just going to be, so X0 is A plus zero times delta X. What's zero times delta X? It's, it's zero, so we just get A, right? So X, X0 in a way, if you want to think about it, X0 is just A. And then XN, we may have, you probably have seen by now what we did before, this is actually B. And then everything else you can get from this formula. Yes. What's i? So i is like it just an, an index essentially. So it says this is the first i, or sorry, this is the first x. So if you're at the first x, the next is one. If you're at the second x, the next, and then i is two. Sorry. So if I'm at the third x, then i is three. Right. So it's just a way to keep them ordered. Uh, but let's say put those things in there. Okay. So we have this formula again. So the left and the right ends should just be themselves, but then the all of every one of them in the middle should be multiplied by two, right? So then for our example, um, we're gonna do, we will look at the integral from zero to one of x squared dx, right? So I need to get a few things before I can plug this into the trapezoid rule. So we'll work on finding those, right? So first question, uh, and let's say we'll use, uh, uh, using for trapezoids. So if I use four trapezoids, which in this case replaces the rectangles, what is delta x going to look like in this case? Yeah, so we do one minus zero over four, which is going to be just one fourth. Good. Now, to get each x, xi, right, we just take that along with a into this formula here, we get those, right? So x zero, as we said, is simply going to be whatever a is, which what is a in our case? Zero. X one is going to be a, which is zero plus one times delta x, which is one fourth. What is zero plus one times one fourth? One fourth. One times one fourth is one fourth. When I add that to zero, I still get one fourth. Okay. Um, we're going to write this down here. X two. So how do we get X two? We take zero because that's a plus. What's next? Two times one fourth. 
You take two times delta x, two times one fourth. What's two times one fourth? X3 follows similarly, and you should get three over four, and then X4 should follow, and you should get one. And then we get the four solutions. Um, just keep in mind, we had an extra one at the beginning, but uh, you still stop at the index that matches however many rectangles the calculator are, right? Which is four. Okay, so then our area under, so this area is approximately, so we take delta x, which is, what's delta x in our case? What's, no, that's a, one four, right. one four, over two times, and then we're gonna do, so we need f of x zero, which is f of zero, plus two, right? So now we go into the next one, we didn't have a two on it. We're gonna do two times f hat of x one. What's it? What's our x one? One fourth. One fourth. What is our so then two times f of x two? What's x two? One half. One half. Plus two times f at um, f of x three. What's x three? Three fourths. Okay. And what do I have left? Um, is just f of one, right? Because it's that's our last our last term. We don't have that one twice. We had all of them twice except the first and the last one. So it's just f one. So then from here, I plug in f in this case is my x squared, right? So I just evaluate each of these. Anybody know what's one fourth divided by two? Not one half. That you did one fourth times two. One eighth. Yeah. So one eighth, and let's multiply. What's what's x squared at zero? Zero, right? Zero squared is zero. Two. What's um, x? Or sorry, what's what's x squared at one fourth? One sixteen. So two times one sixteen plus two times one half squared. One fourth plus two times three fourths squared, which is what? Nine sixteenths and plus just F one. What is X? What is one inside X squared? One. So then we would take all this together, um, which so let's see. Uh, one eighth plus. So this is. So let's see. Uh, I'm just working on simplifying a little bit here. So two times one fourth. One eight over eight. So we get four plus one is five, five plus nine is uh, 14, 14 plus eight is 22. So basically, so this is like 22 over 64 or 11 over, 11 over 32 basically. So after just combining and, and some of my little bit there, we should get probably close to that fraction. Uh, oh, what is it? Where I get one eighth from? What's two times one sixteen, right? And then I got nine eighths because two times nine sixteenths, which is nine eighths, because the two and sixteen is divisible by two. And then one became eight over eight, and then two times one fourth became four over eight, and then I just used that to get it. If you need to take longer than that, that's fine. Uh, but I just want to make sure we have time for everything. So um, it should look. Like this, right? So that's so that's an approximate answer, right? Um, who can tell me what the exact because we know how to do this one, right? What's the exact area of this underneath this curve? So x squared dx. How do I find that? What is it? That's the derivative. 
right? The derivative is 2x. We want to go upwards, right? Okay. So to do, remember, this is an integral, right? We have our little squiggly here. So and when I see this, I, it's the same thing as finding an area. But to get this area, this integral, I want to take its antiderivative. The antiderivative of x squared is x cubed divided by 3. And then I evaluate this from 0 to 1, which is 1. I plug one in there and then plug zero in there. One third and zero. One third and zero. Yeah, you get one third and zero. What's one third minus zero? Mm -hmm. So one third is the exact answer in that case. But our approximation was eleven thirty seconds. So it's pretty good. That's it's not it's not too bad because um, if this was so, it's what if. If it was 11 over 33, right? That's the same thing as, that's the same thing as one third. So it's only a little bit off, maybe a little bigger, but we don't mind too much. It's pretty close. Um, I think the book gives us a decimal of this. It's about 0.344, essentially. Okay. So we have that. So that's Trevor's order rule. Any questions on, on that? A lot of us just plugging in. Just make sure you know the formula and then you can just plug and chuck it. Yes. Yes. I will be. I will be giving for you. You don't have to memorize this, uh, so don't worry about that. Uh, but obviously, um, the reason I like to, you know, really go through all this is just because if you don't understand how to use the formulas, then it won't really help you much to happen. Okay. So, any other questions on Trapezoidal order rule here? Again, just uh, having a formula, plug it in. Just make sure you know kind of what you're doing in that case. Okay. For Simpson's rule. Um, we take a bit of a different approach. And instead of working with trapezoids, I take an area, uh, let's say, like this, and I'll split it up. You know, we'll, I'll, uh, let me make sure one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so I split this up into six rectangles or yeah i have six sections basically it won't end up being rectangles um so now what i want to do right is trapezoids did pretty well but the trapezoids only can go so far because they're still very sharp right you still have to draw a line right whereas these curves um are curvy right so we, we want to be able to find something that fits it and one of the easiest shapes we know how to work with is a is a, is a parabola, right? We can easily solve quadratic equations. You know, we can fiddle around with them a lot and it works out well. So the idea here is I'm going to take every couple of blocks, okay? Um, I'm going to, let me go ahead and write this up here to emphasize whatever you're in is in these problems, right? So it, it didn't matter on re the rectangles or the trapezoids, what n was, but for this rule, we have to have n be an even number. So you can't use an odd number for n. We can't use, you know, five or seven. It has to be two, four, six, eight, et cetera, for this to work. So the reason being is because, um, as you kind of see up here, I'm taking, I'm going to take two, kind of each of these sections, kind of block it off in a, take two blocks at a time, two sections, and kind of group them together, and look at the parabola that most closely fits what's happening at that curve. And so in this case, I get a parabola that looks like, looks like in this, in that spot, right? So remember, so we'll say this is x0, x1, x2, and Corresponding f's at those points, we have f of x0, f of x1, and f of x2. Now, um, we can kind of get a general formula for just the area between a, a parabola, which um, can come from there or um, from knowing that information. But essentially, if I take three points, if I know three points, I can form a parabola. Out of them, I can find a parabola that fits all three of them. 
And the area that's going to be underneath that parabola shape that I formed is exactly this, this equation, right? You don't need to, um, we're not going to really go into too much of how they, how you get this, um, the book doesn't, so I don't feel like I need to either. Um, but this is for one area underneath the parabola, that's that section, right? So the idea is just like with the trapezoid rule is that I found the area of this section or approximately the area of this section. And I can use the same, a similar method. So I'll put another parabola here essentially. So approximate the area of this and then you that parabola and then use an, another, another parabola of sort, which may flip one way or the other to get the area underneath that portion, right? So to get the overall area, right? So if I have an area of this bit, this bit, and this bit, to get the total area, I just add them all up, right? So in this case, let's um, go ahead and name the rest of our points. Um, so this is x3 and x4, and then x5 and x6, right? So we're going to have one parabola that gives us the area that we have here, right, in this section. Over in this section, we're, gonna, we're not going to use x1 or xo anymore. We're going to keep x2, but we're going to use x3 and x4, right, because those are kind of the balance in that section. So the area of that piece, so we'll call this, maybe I'll call this piece A. The area of piece B is going to be delta x over three. Again, f of x2 plus four f of x3 plus f of x4. Right, I already said that was B. And then we'll call this last guy piece C, which this extends further, but just for this example, we'll see what's happening. Um, PC is going to be delta X over three, and we're going to use X4 and X6 as the endpoints and X5 in the middle. So we're going to have F of X4 plus four F of X5 plus F of X6, right? So then if I want the total area, I just take those three pieces and add them together, right? So what do all three of them have in common? What is it? Well, it's the same, it's the same equation used, but I'm I'm more asking what term do all three of them have? Yeah, yeah the delta x over three, right? Good. So they all have the delta x over three, right? So no matter, it's going to get added each time, but we can just factor it out in general, right? So now let's look at what we have left. How many f of x zeros do we have here? One, right? So we have f of x zero. How many f of x ones do we have? Right, there's only one spot, right? There's four of them at that spot. So. We have four f of x one. How many f of x two do we have? One. We have two of them, right? There's one here and one here. So that's two f of x two. Okay. Um, how many x threes do we have? Four of them, right? In this one spot. Okay. Um, how many um, x fours do we have? Two of them plus, and then from here we have four f of x fives. We'll come up to this right down here plus, um, and we only have one f of x six, right? So we get this, right? When we add all this together, so this is my kind of the approximate area using this this idea, right? So we notice is what we notice here is that we have so you have the delta x over three which is always there and then we have one so look at the constants in front of each term we have one four two four two four one right and if you expand it bigger like if we keep adding more pieces it's going to do the same thing so let me use the space over here To write down the general formula. Okay. 
So we have that for under Simpson's rule. That the area is going to be approximately delta x over three times. So again, we're going to take f of x zero just by itself. But instead of two f of x one, I get four f of x one. And then I get two f of x two plus four f of x three. Plus two f of x four plus keeps going, right? It just keeps you keep interchanging each time. So we get four two, four two, four two. And then once we get to so if I have n rectangles, I'm gonna my f of x n minus one term. So if n is six, I get that's x five, right? Should have a four in front. And then finally, I should end with just f of xn. And so this is my basic rule. Um, you don't have to write it this big every time, but I just want to get the point across that you alternate each time. So four, two, four, two, four, two, to be able to be your answer, right? So let's go ahead and work on an example with this, right? So we'll just use the same example. Which is the integral from zero to one of x squared. Yeah, and so we'll see if we can make the same thing. Okay, because eleven over thirty-two was fine, um, but we could have. We were still maybe a little off. So let's see if this one makes it a bit better. Um, which depend on the case, trapezoids so still be better than symptoms, but um, in general, the parabola may approximate better. So we're going to take the integral from zero to one of x squared dx. So so we're going to approximate this. So what is delta x in my case? So let's say, uh, let's see, I think they use less than the four again. Yeah. So they're using n equals four again, right? Which in this case is kind of our, in a sense of our parabola sections. Um, so what is delta x in our case? One fourth again, right? So just like from the trapezoid example, all of our value should still be the same, right? Because if XO is still going to be zero, right? Because that's just whatever A is. X1 is going to be zero plus one times delta X. X2, one half. X3 is three fourths. And X4 is one. Right? Just from the last example, you find them in the exact same way. The delta X and the XO through X, XN do not change. You find them in the same way. This is even the same with the rectangular. Rectangular rule is there, it's the same setup, except in that case, we didn't need to worry about next up, but now we do. Okay, so I take all this and I'm going to plug that into the formula up here, right? So I'm going to have um, delta x over three, so we take one fourth divided by three, and we're going to have f at zero plus four times f at one fourth plus two times f at uh, one half plus what's my next term? Four, yeah, four times f at three fourths, so we'll end up being three fourths squared. Um, plus, right, so now that's our second to last term, right? Because that's x3, so we just need x4. So what is, so my last term should just be f at one, okay? So in that case, it's a little shorter, we just get four, two, four. Right, but it's the, the pattern should still be there. You should have fours on the ends, and then you should alternate in the middle. So four two four two four two four two four two. Four two. Yeah, not like that. Okay, so now we just do the work of kind of plugging in at this point, right? But again, just use the formula and plug straight in from there. So, what is one fourth divided by three? Not three fourths again. It, yeah, it's one twelve, right? Um, if I have a over b, and then I divide that by c over d, right? Cube change flip says that I take a over b, and then I multiply. Keep the top, change the sign in the middle, and then flip the bottom, right? So it becomes d over c, right? 
So what if, so in our case, right, we just have one fourth divided by three, right? But that's not one third, that's three over one, essentially. So this becomes one fourth times one. Fourth. one, fourth. one fourth. Okay, good. So what's f at zero? Zero. So it's still x squared, right? F is our function still x squared. Um, f at one fourth? 60. Mm -hmm. F at one half? One fourth? Four. F at three fourths? Minus 16. Good. And plus, what's that at one? One. One. Okay. So let's see. We have 112 times. So 4 over 16 is the same thing. So 4 times 1 over 16 is the same thing as 1 over 4. Um, I'm going to leave this. I'm going to leave this as 2 fourths just so I can add together. This is the same thing as 9 fourths. Uh, and then I'm going to write 1 as 4 over 4. And so we're going to get, see, 1 plus 2 is 3. 3 plus 9 is 12. 12 plus 4 is 16. So we have 1 12 times 16 over 4. It's going to be, uh, let's see, uh, well, this will, so well, 16 over 4 is the same thing as 4, right? So it's just 1 12 times 4. So funny enough, actually, that's exactly what the answer is supposed to be. Um, so Simpson rule in that case works perfectly. And the reason why is because, I mean, it's a parabola already. So the area shouldn't play it out to be whatever the area under the parabola is. Um, so it's over here. Okay. Yes. So the rule is interchangeable. Trapezoidal and Simpsons. If, if I ask for one, you do that one. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like you can use either. Um, it's not like you can only use Simpsons when it's even, right? So obviously if I, maybe if you get to a situation where you want to use five rectangles, you can't use Simpsons, but in general, the, you can use any of them whenever. It's not like, oh, this situation will be Simpsons and this situation will be trapezoidal, right? You don't need to detect that. The only thing you need to, you just need to be able to read the question to see if I say, use trapezoidal rule or use Simpsons rule. Because I want you to be able to use both. Uh, even if you don't have to necessarily use both all the time. Any other questions? This is, um, with that being said, again, I could do on another example of these um, later if wanted, but um, this is the end of chapter four. So, that's all we got for this section. So from here, we'll uh, take questions. So, cool. Is it, am I good to go and erase this? Is, does anybody else need it? Or? Cool. So, what's, what do you got? Let's, uh, I got a burning, burning question you really need to answer. Okay, man. Number 10? Okay. Um, you want to remind me of number 10? Um, is that, oh, wait, no, it's a, just by you. Yeah, that's <laughs> by you. Okay. So, can you tell me what number 10 is? Uh, the integral of u plus the square root of u plus 1 all over the square root of u. And one to four. One to four? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's, it, what kind of who put u is in there already? I mean, it's it's a variable, right? So it's, I you know, it, it doesn't. Remember, um, the variable that's in there does not affect what happens. Right at all. 
right? We talked about this with derivative, right? If I if I ask what's the derivative of 2x with respect to x, what would you tell me? What is the derivative of 2t with respect to t? It's 2. Okay. What's the derivative of 2b with respect to second b? It's 2, right? The variable doesn't matter, right? And again, in this case, the variable does not matter, right? Typically, we see when, in terms of x because we like to work with our, you know, and in terms of our two dimensional plane, it's usually x, right? But it doesn't have to be. And a lot of times you're going to get in situations where that's not the case, right? The reason we use u for u substitution is just, you know, it's just a convenient variable. I mean, if you, you could, you know, on your on, on every test and quiz and everything, you could just do w substitution instead of like to. It works the same way. You just you just name it differently, right? So don't get too thrown off by the u's being there. It's just a variable, right? You don't you don't even need no. You don't need u. This is this is exactly the quiz question from um, um, the night. Like it was the third one, right? Basically, not not exactly the same, the same idea, right? So I need some ideas. How would I do this? Okay, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do this both. Sounds good. Okay, so this is the integral from one to four of u plus u to the one half. Yeah, that's where it's going. Okay, now what? Okay, so I'm going to, that's, so that's great. I'm going to, I'm going to offer a couple of ideas here though. Um, one is yes, let's, let's take this. Let's just take that u to the one half and, and, and bring it up, right? So we get times u, so that would be times u to what power? Negative one, right? And then I can multiply that. But at the same time, I still, I know how to, I can divide, right? Let's not forget we know how to do division still, right? I know we've had some problems that are harder to divide, but in general, we still know how to do it, right? One of the things I wrote on the board last time was that if I have something to the m power over something to the n power, this is the same thing as x to the m minus n power, right? So there's this wave that's easier to think about. But if I go, let's just divide, right? What is u to the, what power is this u to? One. What's u to the one divided by u to the one half? U to the one half. What is u to the one half divided by u to the one half? They just end up canceling each other. Or you can do one half minus one half, which is zero, but what's anything to the zero power? Just the number one. Okay. And then now this one, I mean, maybe this one doesn't fall straight through, right? But what's one divided by u to the one half? How can I rewrite that? Yeah, u to the negative one half. Right? Right. And in fact, also, if I have x to the one over x to the m power, this is just x to the negative m power. Again, we, we know that one, right? Which is kind of what we use here, but we know how to divide. So sometimes it's easier just to do this. But if I choose to do this side, right? What is u to the first power times u to the negative one half? Not u to the negative one half, u to the positive one half, right? Because now if I'm if I'm multiplying, we add the exponents, right? So I take so u to the first times u to the negative one half is u to the one minus one half, which is just u to the one half. What is u to the one half times u to the minus one half? U to the zero, which is one. One. Okay. What's one times u to the minus one half? U to the minus one half. Yeah. So, whichever way is easier, right? But sometimes, like, you know, if you don't need to bring it up, just, just divide, it, right? Well, this is fine too. I'm not, I'm not mad at anybody does that for, that for sure. Um, but, Yeah, so let's take, so I'll rewrite this. So we have one to four of u to the one half plus one plus u to the minus one half. Okay, that one. We just do them all individually. 
Great. So what is the integral of u to the one half? So that's so that comes from remember so the uh, normal antiderivative of u to the one half would be we do u to the one half plus one over one half plus one, which is u to the two thirds. And then we'll see of course there's no bounds over two thirds or sorry. Uh, Right, and then coming off of our discussion of key chain flip, that three halves can come up with the two thirds that can give us what we have here. So two thirds u to the three halves. What's the integral of one du? Just u. It's not me, you guys. It's you. Seriously. <laughs> so okay, what's and then what's the integral of u to the negative one? So two u to the one half, follows the same reasoning here. Um, again, feel free to do work in YouTube to get that. Um, I'm not really, I'd rather do that, um, but just to save time. Okay, uh, sorry, no more. So now we have bounds, right? So I evaluate this thing from one to four, okay? So what that means is that first I take four and I plug it in, right? So maybe I'll get um, so I, I need to do two thirds times four to the three halves plus four plus two times four to the one half minus two thirds times one to the three halves plus one plus two times one to the one. Are we, have, are we likely to run the three half powers to the final exam? Um, there's, there's potential, right? Um, you go right. So if I'm taking x something to the n divided by n power, how we approach this, right, is I just take one piece at a time, right? So, and I can do that either way. Let's say that I can, I see m up here and I know, oh, x to the n power would be pretty easy, okay? Well, then I just start off by taking x and I raise it to the n power, right? So I would see what x to the n power is. Once I find x to the n power, I then raise that to the one over n power, right? So as an example, in art and uh, well, actually, I can show both ways. For example, I have, we have four to the three half power, so I can first do four cubed, and then raise that to the one half power. So what's four cubed? Sixty-four. And what's sixty-four? Basically, sixty-four to the one half is the same thing as six, the square root of sixty-four, which is eight. Okay, I also, if I know the root easier, right, let's say that the power is kind of big, so it would be hard to that way, but I can easily take square root of the cube root of the number. So then I can take, then I would do x to the one over n first, and then take that to the n power, right? So in our case, again, so I have four to three caps, I could do this as four to the one half power or square root of four, and then cube that, right? So what is the square root of four? Two. And what is two to the third power? Two. Another equal, okay? So it doesn't matter which one you do. Um, usually one might be easier than the other, um, but they're both valid, okay? So, but that's how you evaluate. If you have a fraction that has both the numerators and denominator, Split it up like that first. So do one part of it, do the other part. Okay. So carrying that over here. So we have two thirds times, we said four to the three half power is what? Eight plus four plus four to the one half. Two. So we have two times two minus, and then uh, one to the three halves is still just one. One to any power is one, right? Well, uh, no, never mind. Well, we don't, we don't need to worry about that uh, <laughs> for now. Okay, two thirds uh, plus, maybe we'll talk about that too. Um, two thirds plus one plus, and then two times one to the one half is still just one, so we get two. So, let's do a little bit of arithmetic work here. Uh, let's see, eight times two, so 16 over three. 
plus four plus four minus two thirds, and then one plus two is three, so I'm just three. So let's see, 16 minus two is 14. So four plus four is eight, eight minus three is five, and then five times three is 15. So you get 14 plus 15 over three. So 29 thirds should be. In any case, even if we mess up the number here, you're there, you're always, you know, always, not always happens from time to time. Um, the process still is the same. Okay. Questions there? Comments, concerns? Here, yeah. So this is so this is two thirds plus three, and here, right? But since the minus is outside, you need to take that to each term individually. Oh. So you wouldn't do minus two thirds plus three, right? It has to be minus two thirds minus three, right? I think if you remember, there's one quiz I think it's a, everybody lost, or not everybody. Most people lost at least a point because they forgot to to do that. So just be very careful. Other questions, comments, concerns? Okay. Now give me another question. What is this? 13. Uh, okay, so this is the the two part. Okay. Um, let's see. And we, there's not going to be one like this on the test, actually. Um, I, I merely put it in practice. Um, if you want to talk to me about it and like go through it to understand, that's great. Um, but maybe at the same time, we'll go through a different one. One's good. Number one, please. Number one? Yeah, absolutely. This is the differential one. Um, what's the function? Y equals 2x cubed minus 3x squared. Okay. And then what's my. Uh, not the actual theater. Point six. Was it? Point six? Yes. Okay. Okay. So we want to we want to find delta y and dy. And we kind of want to sketch maybe a little bit of a picture. Um, maybe at least have an understanding. Um, if you don't do that part. Um, but at least I need you to know how to get delta x, delta y, dy. Okay. So if you remember, so I need two things, delta y, I need dy. Remember how to get delta y. Yeah, so so think think back to when you're doing the four step process, right? We would have we would you would start off, and if I have y equals f of x, then I would write rewrite it as y plus delta y equals f of x plus delta x. Right, um, and then for the next part, I was solve for delta y. Which would be the same thing as I would have f of x plus delta x minus y, which y in this case is f of x. Okay, so in our case, delta y is the same thing as f of x plus delta x minus f of x. Long story short, I'm saying evaluate the function of two values and subtract subtract it. Right. So I'm evaluating f of x plus delta x, and then evaluating f of x and then subtract. Okay. So okay. So oh we have an x, right? X is two. Yeah, yeah, x is two. Okay. So to find delta y, I'm gonna plug the x I'm given and the delta x I'm given into this formula. We have f, which is gonna be two plus zero point six. Minus f of two. Okay. And then we put that into our right? Which is what's our function? 2x cubed minus 3x squared. Yeah. So that's where I'm plugging these numbers into. So I'm going to have two times 2 plus 0.6 is the same thing as 2.6 uh, minus 3 times 2.6 squared. 
minus f of two, which is just two times two, two minus three times two. Okay. Um, on the on the test, I'll give you a nicer. Uh, should give you nicer values, so we'll just kind of calculate this out real fast and see if we have. So then you just you just plug this into you know if you want to use vector in here not on the test for sure but uh, so this is going to be let's see thirty five point one five two minus twenty point two eight thank you and then this one's easier because I already this is two cubed is eight eight times two is sixteen. And then two squared is four, four times two is so then we take 35.152 minus 20.28. So this is going to be 14.872. And we subtract what's 60 minus 12? 24. So then we get 10. Should 10.872? I'm correct. Okay. Good. So that's so that's delta y. Right, so that means the distance between f at two point six and f at two is ten point eight seven two. Like that, these that's the exact distance. Now, so that's delta y. The problem also wants us to find dy. How do I find dy? Divide by delta x. So, um, if we were if we were doing the full four step process, we would. Um, and it, it kind of, I mean, it's it's. You could actually use a four-step process to get here. Technically, um, we're going to shortcut it though. This is simply f prime of x dx, right? We know from the four-step process of doing the derivative that the limit of delta y over delta x is dy over dx, which is which is f prime. But then we get multiplied the dx on. Okay. Now what this is going to do is this is this should be a good approximation of this number down here. All things considered, right? So, what is f prime of x in our case? So, 6x squared minus what? Minus 6x. Okay. So, now I just plug in x and dx, right? But dx and delta x are the same thing. Okay, those values are both the same. So, I'm going to have 6 times 2 squared minus 6 times 2. And then times 0.6. Okay, six times four is 24. Uh, six times two is 12. So we basically get 12 and then we'll put that by 0.6. So, so yeah, 7.2. So all things since they're not the greatest approximation, but um, we're doing 0.6, right? Instead of like point. So it wouldn't be the greatest, but so this is my my dy in this one, right? So now the, the idea of um so I'll do a, the idea of the last part is to basically so I, I have an idea of where these couple of points are at, right? So we have so f at two is four, right? So about four, so two here. And then f at 2.6 is supposed to be here, right? So the curve probably does something. You know, it's like, it may not do that exact thing, but it passes through the point that way, right? So what, what we're getting, right, is, is this distance here is supposed to be my delta, delta one, okay? That's the actual distance between the two points. But if I'm concerned about f at two, right, I kind of want to get an idea of maybe what the tangent line looks like at that point, right? So it's gonna do something like this um, and touch the curve, right? Now where this value comes in is that's, uh, this distance is my dy. Right, so dy is essentially the distance between your point and 
kind of the later point on the on the line itself, whereas delta y is the actual distance between the two points, right? So if your curve, if we move it closer, right? So if your dx, uh, which maybe I should add on here. Uh, that this distance here is delta x dx if i make that short enough and the line and the curves be pretty close so instead of doing all this work i can cut it short by doing this okay so that's the idea right um i, don't, I probably won't ask you for this part as much but definitely not yes so the delta y and the dy formula is going to be on the sheet or that? yeah yes okay um, and last time i put it I can't remember there's any, I didn't put the like, trig function values, I think, but that was, I put everything else for the most part. That should be it. I, I should put, you should have everything, right? The goal is, is, is that hopefully you have at least a knowledge of them to be able to be like, oh, I know which one to use instead of like in the package sheet, be like, oh, this is all very foreign to me. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. no. Okay. Yeah. On this test, or not, uh, because we are only covering, so we're covering 3.6 to 4.9. And all of that stuff was chapter six. So the rest of the semester will have nothing to do with that stuff, aside from the final, um, which is, I don't know what to do. Um, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> Questions here? Yes, no, maybe so. Okay. I'll take that as a no. All right. Give me another no questions. Number eight. Okay. I was I was like, oh wait, you guys have that master already? <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Number eight. Uh, what's number eight? Uh, the indefinite interval of d squared times d cubed times four all the bit. This? Yeah. Okay. I like that. Okay. Ideas. Your substitution. Okay. That's you. No, not yet. Not B squared. Um, that will not help us. Okay. What, what should you be? B cubed minus four. Yep. Um, you can you can feel free to try B squared if you want, but you'll end up having to try something else. That will work. Yeah. What number is this? This is number eight. Mm -hmm. So I need the derivative of u in that case. What's the u? Yeah, and no, we like put a bit of a dv on the as well. Okay. So is that what I have? Do I have this up there? No. So what do I need to do? Divide three on both sides. So we get du divided by three is d squared dv. Okay. Which you have that. Okay, so there's my substitution. Let's rewrite it. What's this going to turn into? So I'll, I'll get to that real quick. Um, so we're going to have this. This thing comes u to the fifth power times, and then I substitute v squared dv for du over three. Right. So just putting things in first. Right. So again, this is the base squared db right here, and that's which means that we can take since this is just du divided by three, three is just, you know one third is just a constant. I can take it to the outside, so I get the integral. Okay. How do I do that? Yes. No. It's just three. Right. What is the integral be for the du? Uh, Of course, it's an indefinite integral. We don't want to forget. Okay. So 
I get 118 because of 6 times 3. And then what should I put in for you? BQ uh, times 4. Six power. So that's right. So the reason we had to divide by three is because in our original integral, we didn't have three v squared dv. We only had v squared dv. So I wanted I wanted this piece over here to match what was inside the integral. So what I did is I divided three to move the three over to the du side. And so I get du over three equals v squared dv, which I have v squared dv, right? So then I put the u in, and then that just becomes the du. So now it's it's all in terms of du, and now the only thing that's different is like a constant. So I move that up. Hmm? Why does a uh, du disappear when you integrate? So um, a way, another maybe a way to think about this. Um, I had this question a couple times. Um, so remember our definition of, of integrals, right? Mm -hmm. Or the definite, how we defined integrals was, you know, we started with like a sum, right? Everything came from a sum, right? And those sums were built on, you have like a rectangle at each point, right? So you would have the length and the width of that rectangle. And then you would have, um, you know, you'd have the sum basically adding up all the rectangles together. So in our case, that sum has essentially become this integral sign and the height is whatever the thing is on the inside and the width is that D part, right? Yeah. So after you, you take the integral, right? You're essentially finding the area of the way. And so then you just get a quantity, right? So the width is not there anymore. The sum isn't there anymore. You get something out of it, right? So once I perform this operation, the D, right? The DU shouldn't be there anymore, essentially, right? I mean, we can ask the same question Technically, a way like, well, I don't know. Does that make does that make sense a little bit? Yeah. I just after you've done the operation, these pieces kind of take each other out, so they're not they're not anymore. Other questions? Here. Okay. Um, I want to make a quick mention while I'm thinking about it. Um, as kind of a, a pro tip, if, if it helps. Um, let's say that you're doing a problem, and actually, uh, it's number nine. This is a t over t squared minus one, t squared plus one, four t. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And then what's the what are the bounds on that? Zero. Zero one, okay. And then it's t over 40 over t squared plus one. Okay. So um, I don't know if I explained this one, but I just wanted to use this as, as an example. Um, I, I taught in class that, and this is, I taught it because that was the way I learned how the book kind of goes through it. Um, that you do the antiderivative part, find the integral first, and then once you plug the, the, the variable back in at the end, then you can plug in the bounds, right? If it's easier, so in this, so actually, let's, so how would I do this integral? So what would you be in this case? Okay. What's the U? Is that what I have inside the integral? Okay, what do I do with that then? So, yeah, I, a lot of our examples we divided don't assume we always divide, right? Because in this case, I want 4t dt, but I only have 2 dt. 2t dt, right? So I'm going to take both sides and multiply this by 2, and I get 2 du equals 4t, which then is exactly what I have. Yeah. 
English teaching. Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, maybe that's something else I'm thinking as well. Um, there's there's really a few ways you can kind of go about doing this. I did see some of you doing it that way. I think what he what he's talking about. I'll basically show that real quick. So, what if you know trying to match what's inside make it a little weird at times? So instead, what you do. So we have this. This is true, right? So you can do that. Um, plug it in. But what I could also do is I could just say. I'm gonna take this thing, I have dt, so I'm gonna solve this for dt. So when I do that, I get dt is gonna be du divided by 2t, right? Now, the reason why that's a, why this works okay, right, is because, so we'll leave off the bounds, delete something in that case. Um, I'm gonna have 4t over, and then t squared plus one is u, so I get u squared, times dt, which dt in this case is du over 2d, right? So from here, right, notice as long as things work out, those the t should cancel. I might have a constant left over, but the t all the t part should go away, right? So then this is the same. If you did it this way or did it this way, it should get the same outcome, which is going to be the integral of 2, because you get 4 divided by 2 is 2. Um, and then du over. Okay, so that's a good. That's a you know if you'd like to do that, that's that's great. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is that there's all this business of like having to leave off the bounds until you get to because you don't want to actually plug in the bounds at the wrong point, right? So another way you might be able to remedy that to make it simpler for yourself is just to change. The bounds, right? In, in terms of where you're at now, right? So we started with t, we were at in t world, we went from zero to one. So now we're going in u world from we don't know yet, but we can figure it out. t at zero. If t is zero, what's u, right? So if let's all write this down here t is zero, u is one. If t is one, u is two. So I could actually take this and do one to two, right? It's doing something you'd already do later and just shorten and just cut down the process, right? So instead of zero to one, I just plugged in both my bounds and I get one to two. What is the integral of du over u squared? So how would I do that, I guess? So it's u to the negative two du, right? And then we get two times. So that what would that turn into? Which is so, and then this is from one to two. So we get negative two u to the negative one from one to two, right? Now I don't change it back here. I just plug in those new numbers I got. So I would get negative two times two to the negative one. Or actually, like, uh, I'm going to rewrite this as because u to the negative first power is the same thing as you just plug the u back down. So we just get 2 over u and then from 1. So I get negative 2 over 2 minus uh, negative 2 over 1, which is a b, what is that, negative 1 plus 2 is 1. So what would be the answer there? Okay, now again, let me just emphasize, right? If you don't like that, it's fine. Um, if you don't like other things, you want to stick to the method you learned, great. Um, it just helps some people to, to see it this way, right? Then what happens is, is I can, you know, so let's, so uh, I'll do it here real quick. So, uh, so alternate, alternate universe here. If we left the bounds off, right? You should still get, no matter how you do it, you should still get two times du over u squared, which is two times, uh, so it ends up being negative one over u, right? But u in our case was t squared plus one, so then I would, so those are, these are between some bounds that we don't know, is negative two over t squared plus one, right? Because that was u. So then once I plug that back in, I go from zero to one. 
And so I get negative two over one squared plus one minus negative two over zero squared plus one, which is negative two over two, which is negative one minus, so plus two over one, which ends up being one again. Okay. This simply just says, I don't want to go back to, to the original variable, so I'll just do it this way. But either way is bound. If you want to stick to that way, that's fine. Just to mention, because uh, I've seen, I've seen some people at least do this and that, so just do this. Okay. Um, if you don't like those, you can always stick to the way you, you know, I do. Don't need to worry about that. Okay. Questions? There. Okay. What other, what other study guy questions are troubling you? Number two? Okay. So, has everyone seen my app? Okay. Um, my apologies. Um, I, a lot of the, a lot of the study guide ones I just, I took from my, the big study guide I wrote for top one last semester. And I was trying, I wanted to make it harder for them. Um, so that's why I didn't, but I didn't want to make it that hard. You guys did it. Um, and the idea was, so initially, right, you're given an equation and then you would say, you know, D, you know dy is f prime of x dx and you would evaluate from there. But the case in that example was you had a volume where you were given this, the error in the surface area, and then you would use that error in the surface area to get the error in the volume. But there was kind of a transition to get back to the, the radius and then get to the volume. And so I was like, we're not, I won't have you do that. Um, because honestly, I kind of forget <laughs> how to do it at the moment anyway. So um, what, okay, so we're dealing with the sphere again, right? We're talking about a volume. Um, and what was the value they gave? R was four. Dr was point two. Okay. And I just wanted to, it was the same thing as the quiz question, right? The quiz question was find the approximate for maximum error um, and then find the relative error, right? So how do I find the approximate error in this case? We're going to take the derivative, right? Um, right, and I want, so I want the error in the V, right? So I want DV, which is, you know, whatever, so F prime of R dr, right? So I'm taking the derivative of this guy. They're not the same thing here, I just don't know why we're taking the derivative of. So what is the derivative of four thirds pi times R cubed? Okay. Right, so it's gonna, it ends there, right? So what is four thirds pi here? Well, it's just it's not an R, so it's still. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's just, it's a constant, right? Mm -hmm. It's a number, right? If I take the derivative of that thing, just zero, it's just a number, right? So the derivative of that, I, the four thirds pi is just gonna carry over. So I gotta do it, right? So then all I need to do is the derivative of R cubed. Right? Now let's emphasize again, right? If I have a constant times a function, the derivative of that thing is just on the constant times whatever the derivative of the function part is. You don't need to do a rule on that, okay? Um, just to save you the work. So four thirds pi, and then we're just doing the derivative of r cubed. What is the derivative of r cubed? Three r squared. Okay, so what is four thirds pi times three r squared? So you get 12 thirds pi r squared, which ends up being 4 pi r squared, and then times dr. Right, so dv is just going to be 4 pi r squared dr. Okay, 4 thirds times 3 is 4. Okay, so that means that dv is going to be 4 pi times r, which is what? 4 squared times 22, right? So what's four times four times four, 
right? Because we have four and then the fourth pair. Four. And then times 0.2. So 64 pi times 0.2 is going to be uh, what is that? 12.8 pi. Okay. Um, I should give you another easy one. That would be pretty simple to calculate. Um, we get 12.85. Okay. Um, so then how do I get the relative error? So we want to find the volume, right, first. Because if we're finding the relative error, I need to have something to relate it to. So I want to find the volume. So volume is 4 thirds pi times 4 to the third power. So this ends up being 4 cubed times 4. That's going to be 206. Uh, this doesn't apply actually. No. So you leave that. So the relative error, right? Once we have this, or you can get the decimal, um, is going to be well, actually the next right. <laughs> the relative error is dB divided by B, right? So if I know the, the error, the approximate error, and I divide it by the actual volume, I see kind of how bad relatively it is. In comparison to the volume itself. So to get dv over b, I simply just need to take 12.85 divided by 256 over 3, which the pi will go away and then we'll end up with some sort of decimal. Does anybody calculate that? What is it? Uh, should it be? I think it's probably 0.14. Let's see, twelve point eight divided by six. Okay, I got. Uh, I just got. Point. Uh, and so that's so that's the relative error. You multiply by that hundred, you get the percentage error. So it's about fifteen. Could be fifteen percent. Okay, um, we're out of time here. Um, I'm, I have office hours, uh, so feel free to come talk to you then. Um, if you have more questions you want to talk about, um, I'm still going to take a quiz with me, so just come to the top. Um, or just, uh, you know, I'll have an act after we walk tomorrow as well. Stop by then. Uh, happy to help out. So, well, I'll be in the Wednesday before the test. Um, uh, uh, I will. I will. Uh, I, I will. See, I have assignments of my own that need to be for the. So. Oh yeah, we you like here. So now I'm real fast. Mr. Warren.